I'm Mary Walshock from UCSD, and I've been acting as the director of the San Diego Dialogue over the three years now that we've been focusing on the Borderless Innovation Initiative. And while the last of you are getting your lunches, I'm going to make some opening remarks, and then I'm going to invite Deborah Lazard from Merck, Sharp, and, and Dome <clears throat> to come up and make some comments, and then I'll invite the uh, three commentators to join us on the stage after Deborah makes her remarks. But I would just like to remind all of you, and it's so heartening to see the growing numbers of people who are coming to these forums each year. I think it speaks to the sense of optimism and opportunity more and more, more, and more of us are seeing in the cross-border region. We live in an era of global innovation, global markets, and global competitiveness. And the mutual benefits of our cross-border location, Baja California and San Diego County, are becoming clearer and clearer to all of us. Leveraging and taking advantage of our complementary assets and integrating the value chain, particularly in high value added sectors, which is a very high priority for the US government, for our governor in California, as well as for the New Mexican administration and the governor of Baja, that this focus on how do we increase the number and diversity of high value added <clears throat> sectors and jobs uh, that we uh, share and can grow together. I think that <clears throat> our efforts last year were very exciting and as you, many of you will recall, you saw the study Borderless Innovation, which began to identify some targets of opportunity. We were extremely fortunate that a very um, uh, a, a major uh, multinational corporation, Merck, had already embraced within the United States and been an important leader uh, the innovation agenda. And we learned that they were doing similar work in Mexico. So subsequent to last year's forum, a relationship was formed between the global pharmaceutical company Merck, their subsidiary in Mexico City, Merck Sharp and Dome, and the San Diego Dialogue to explore one component of what we identified as the opportunities for borderless synergies in the high tech and life sciences arena. And you were presented a very, very superficial introduction to the work we are now doing on what we are calling the borderless uh, biotech life science uh, opportunity. In this uh, brief report, which will result in four much deeper studies of four very exciting regions in Mexico, you begin to see the way in which the scientific innovation and uh, commercialization capabilities of Mexico are increasing at very high rates, particularly in the life science space. Our feeling is this was a good place to begin because this is the future uh, arena for San Diego as well. We are one of the most dynamic biotech regions in the world in R&D, in company formation, and in venture capital investment. So I'm very excited to share with you the key ideas that are embedded in this Borderless Biotech Initiative, beginning with a presentation <clears throat> by my new best friend, Deborah Lazard from Mexico City, and then followed by some commentary by some very smart people who are working here in the cross-border region. So let me tell you a couple of things about Deborah, and then she will describe to you the larger innovation effort. Deborah has been with Merck Sharp and Dome since 2005, and she has been responsible for the company, which is, does more than a billion dollars of business in Mexico, for developing projects that focus on the innovation factors that affect the competitiveness of Mexico and Mexico's national innovation system. She began her professional career in 1993 at the Mexico Institute of Industrial Property. And in fact, she designed and implemented strategies that led to the creation of the biotechnology department in the patent division of that institution. 
She established uh, programs to foster technological innovation within that arena, and that in part uh, was what attracted Merck to her. And she uh, was promoted to patent director uh, at the federal level in 2003. She has won a number of awards and has been very much involved in international discussions about patenting and IP issues. Very, very critical issues when you talk about the life sciences and biotechnology. Deborah has a bachelor's degree from the Autonomous University of Mexico. She has master's degrees in molecular biology and a PhD in experimental pathology. She has also been uh, recognized for what, uh, her research and was the recipient of the Dr. Jorge Rosencrantz uh, Award for outstanding research related to the amoeba, amoeba's molecular biology. And for a sociologist, Deborah, that's about as far as I can go. So I'd like everyone to welcome Dr. Deborah Lazard from Mexico City. This initiative uh, was launched over three years ago at a Partnership for Prosperity meeting in San Francisco. And it was launched by Merck, which is called Merck Sharp and Dome outside of the United States. And with uh, the governments of Mexico and the government of the United States and the Council on Competitiveness. This initiative had and still has three objectives, three clear objectives. First of all, and I think is the central one, the most important, is to foster and develop a culture within Mexico in which innovation is recognized as an essential part of prosperity. As a second level objective, we would like to build awareness on the importance of the enabling conditions for innovation. And by enabling conditions, what we mean is those conditions that help create an ecosystem in which innovation can flourish. I'm going to give you some examples. For example, uh, intellectual property rights, of course, rule of law and ethics, uh, free trade, uh, open trade and investment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We do know that those enabling conditions are not enough for innovation to flourish but are really important that they are there. It's, uh, it's, it's necessary, but it's not sufficient. And third, of course, we would like to see advanced commercialization of identified technologies. Now, the question that a lot of people ask me when I talk about these objectives, and I think it is a, a fair question, is why is Merck involved? Why do we care? And I would like to explain this a little bit. We have three reasons for which we are involved in this initiative. The first one has to do with the culture of industrial property rights. As you may know, I suppose, the pharma industry has had a long, difficult relationship with developing countries, Latin American countries, in Mex and Mexico included, when we talk about intellectual property rights. It has been a relationship of confrontation. Uh, and, and I believe this can be explained really simple. When you think that intellectual property rights are important, are of the most importance for those who create innovation. And so we believe that by fostering the developing of innovation in Mexico, we can really move the discussion from confrontation to collaboration. And uh, by doing this, we can also move the way our company is perceived in Mexico and in Latin American countries. This is the first reason and the most important one. Uh, in a second level, there is this corporate, corporate social, social responsibility in which we care about our media and our surroundings and innovation in the long run, well, even in the short run, brings prosperity. And prosperity is good for business. That's quite clear. And 
the third the reason why we are involved. In the next slides, you will see that Mexico has an amazing scientific platform. And there's no reason, really, to not believe that in Mexico we can find the molecule that cures cancer. So we would like to be a, a, to create strategic alliances with these inventions as a pharmaceutical company, as you know. So I think these are the three reasons and are quite clear why we're here. So let me go back again to the story of, of, of this initiative. The first uh, phase of this initiative was in 2005. At this time, we decided to do a study with the Council on Competitiveness throughout Mexico, specifically in three regions, which were Monterrey, Guadalajara, and, the Me and Mexico City with Cuernavaca, and to uh, analyze uh, what, are, what were the conditions, general conditions for innovation in the life science to flourish in, this, in these regions. And also to give a little bit of idea of, of policy at the national level. From phase one, which was completed in December, we had uh, three things, an assessment of the national and regional policy environment for life science innovation, a specific areas of strengths and weaknesses in the Mexican life science sector, and third, clear recommendations to strengthen the life science sector in Mexico. Okay, th these ones are, are the recommendations. I'm not gonna read them. What we have done from 2006 onward is to try to transform the, these recommendations into very clear programs in which we can address these recommendations. And although the Life Science Gateway Initiative addresses actually all of them, I would like to focus on the last one, which is uh, that it was important for Mexico to build up on innovation through building binational strategic alliances that promote the development of products and services within the sectors of the life sciences. And that's how it came, it was born the idea of, of this, the Life Science Gateway Initiative. Okay, uh, I, I would like at this point to give you uh, the point of view of Merck in terms of what is our premise and what, why do we believe in this initiative. It says there that we, we believe in the power of partnership. And I'll tell you a little bit of story of Merck, maybe you know it, but uh, Merck during a lot of years rely for innovation in our own sources, our own scientific sources. And from some years back, five, six years, this has completely changed and we have moved our eyes outside the company and tried to develop strategic alliances with uh, universities, small companies, etc. So we have learned what, what it says here, really. We have learned that knowledge alone is no longer power anymore, that finding and sharing knowledge is the power, and that smart companies will trade ideas with customers, suppliers, and even competitors. And, and that's true for Merck. So we do believe that in, the, in this idea, in this concept, we have lived it by ourselves. So we are promoting it through this initiative. Okay, so this is the, the objective of the, of the Life Science Gateway Initiative. Uh, I will read it as it is because it's exactly what, what we want to gain through this. It, the, this initiative strives to contribute in the creation of new kinds of collaboration and of regional, national, binational alliances between the academic, private, and public sectors, promoting the development of clusters of innovation in Mexico, complementing the competitive needs of California. It's a, a, a big goal, but we hope we're gonna get there. The next one, please. Now, uh, the strategy. The strategy, as you can see, has to do a lot with partnerships. That's what we are trying to achieve. Uh, through our association with the UCSD San Diego Dialogue, we would like to contribute the, in the creation of these clusters of innovation in Mexico, in these four regions in Mexico. And we are going to do it, or we're trying to do it through promoting partnerships between the academic and the private sectors in Mexico and San Diego. 
Now this is more uh, down to earth, the, the program, which, which has an, an 18 uh, month period and that it has uh, some important things. We started with the scouting of the regions in search of mature technologies. I would like to tell you that we have done this already and that part of the report you have is actually the outcome of, of this searching, of this scouting. I will refer to it in a little while, but let me tell you that we were really impressed of what we found in these regions. Second, uh, which is really important, is the training of technology talent scouts for each region. I would like to make a stop here and, and just clarify some idea about these regions. I think it's, it's really important that you know that these regions have amazing, amazing uh, basic science platform. All of them, actually. And that what we know now, we, we don't have to do the scouting to know this, we know that we, we don't have some of the elements that are necessary in these regions to transform this amazing platform into innovation and products and services, real ones. This uh, machinery does not exist as it is. So that's why we are thinking in this, in this uh, steps. So it makes sense to you why, why we decided to do like this. Of course, we need scouts in these regions, the scouts that are capable of the detecting the mature technologies and that have the relationships and the capacity to help these technologies to transform into products. Then we are gonna have uh, workshops in San Diego, workshops that are uh, on relevant areas as IP strategies, which we already had last month, uh, capital access, information, government, etc., etc. What we want is that these regions uh, get the sense of, and the relationships from San Diego of how to do these things that are necessary for this transformation. And of course, we are thinking of the national programs of academic interchange with the, G, with the regions, which already exist, but we, we want to promote more of that. The next one, please. Okay, which, which are the regions? I suppose all of you know of, of these places. Uh, we have uh, Monterrey uh, in Nuevo León, Cuernavaca in Morelos, Irapuato in Guanajuato, Guadalajara in Jalisco, and of course we are looking at this region as a mega region. We're looking San Diego and we're looking Baja California with their amazing assets. Uh, a, a lot of times, well, lately, people are asking me why, why these regions. The, the major question they, they ask me is why not Mexico City, where, where we have everything and more? No, <laughs> why not? So this is the answer. This is really why we choose these four regions. I think the main reason and the most important one is that this four, well, these five regions, have uh, leadership. That, that's, that's really important. I mean, we are not, in Spanish we say, no estamos inventando el hilo negro. I really don't know how to say it in English, I'm sorry. Uh, we're not inventing nothing, nothing new. I mean, these regions are trying by themselves to conform as clusters of innovation in the life sciences. They are doing their work. They are, they are going to do it with us or without us. That's the truth. We are just trying to be a catalytic factor in helping them develop the cluster. So, so having that, it's, it, it's really more than half of the way, the willingness and the leadership to do it. That's the first one and the most important one. The second one is, uh, as I told you before, these four or five regions, better, they have amazing, amazing science, uh, basic science platform. Amazing, world, world class. So we have there a hidden treasure, I see it that way at least, a hidden treasure that nobody is exploding. And there it is for us. Well, not for us, for them. And, uh, and then there's the last one. Now some of the regions has a history of international relationship involving manufacturing, 
capacities and supply networks of very high level, which is also important. So in the next slides, I will uh, present you the five regions. Uh, I will go through them really fast uh, because you have the report. I will just want to say two words about each one of what I think of them, and, and that's it. Okay, Irapuato, I think that the most amazing thing is its basic science in terms of agrobiotech which is world class. I think there's no other place like that in Latin America, I'm sure, and, me, and many other places in the world. Just to tell you about it, they are going to open the doors for a new uh, genomics institute, which costs $50 million. Luis Herrera is going to be the director, and he has been working in uh, decoding the corn genome. Guadalajara, Jalisco, which you might know for tequila and mariachis, you'll be surprised, which is the origin really of those two, but it's much, much, much more than that, as you can see there. It's also a place where uh, pharmaceutical industries have been placed for many years. Mexican pharmaceutical industries we have there with uh, patents and a long history of innovation. Monterrey, I suppose, a lot of you know, know Monterrey, the history of entrepreneurship there, it's amazing. And now all the system they're doing surrounding medical services, it's, it's one of surprises. Cuernavaca, uh, well, there you can see it, but just to let you know, they have 39 research centers. They have the biggest number of scientists per capita and a published per capita that it's near to the uh, OCD countries. It's, it's amazing what's happening there. And of course, your region, I don't have to tell you too much about it, you know it, but we are amazed with what you have here in terms of uh, strengths in manufacturing in Baja, for example, in the medical devices, or all of what San Diego can offer as a region. In this one, I will stop a little bit just to tell you, I, we see that the lives, in the life cycle of innovation, what we see here is an opportunity because we see complementary capabilities between the Mexican regions and the mega region. And we hope we act as a catalyst to make them engage in a very uh, productive way. Thank you very much. I, re I really commend the report to you because we have very interesting data in there on PhD graduates in basic science fields across Mexico, uh, patenting, scientific citation information, and uh, a few uh, profiles of specific uh, products or initiatives that uh, we at the dialogue feel are especially relevant to the San Diego and the California life science industries. We're now going to move into a discussion uh, about uh, these ideas. What are the barriers to potential partnerships as well as what might some of the enablers be? So what we'd like to do in the next 20 minutes or so, I have a couple of leading questions for Joe and Gerardo as the hands-on science and biotech guys in this region. And uh, then I'd like to ask uh, Deborah and Alberto to weigh in. So I, I think you were told in advance the questions I was going to ask you. So I'm going to start with you, Joe. Um, and and the, really the question I'd like to focus on to begin with is San Diego and California. Because as a leader in the life science industry, you've been involved with the California Healthcare Institute and others that are thinking about the future of this industry for the state and for our region, what do you see as some of the major challenges? And you know what the second question will be. Could Mexico help us address some of those challenges as we think about the future? Thank you, Mary. It, it's a real pleasure to be here. As Mary said, I've spent a lot of my career traveling <clears throat> all over, uh, and it really did help me a lot to understand not only uh, what goes on in the rest of the world, but the fact that we have a unique region here. Uh, and that region, when I talk about that region, in my mind, 
that region extends all the way from the middle of California all the way down <clears throat> into uh, Baja California as well. And that gets to the answer to, to my question. As we uh, host the uh, International Biotechnology Convention here next year, where we'll have 25,000 people coming to San Diego from all over the world, we'll be building on experiences that we've had for 10 years now in which we've seen each year increasing global competitiveness to create and to grow and, and to obtain resources, scarce resources, to build this industry that we call life sciences, the combination of diagnostics and medical devices and drugs and therapies, and in the future, a lot more in the way of information science that goes to understanding our genetics and, and developing products that improve life and improve quality of health. And everyone wants to have this life science industry. So we have a lot to be proud of here. Uh, we have um, done such things as, as created some of the, the uh, most promising drugs to treat cancer and therapies to treat HIV AIDS and some of the most uh, cutting edge diagnostic tools uh, to, to uh, be able to detect hepatitis and other important kinds of diseases. Uh, but we can't rest on our laurels. Uh, we have to face this tremendous competitiveness that we see all over the world and rise to the challenge. And the challenge is in three areas. We continue to need the cutting edge, innovative science research. We continue to need the people, not only to do that research, but to grow and evolve the companies that uh, we create as a result of the technology transfer uh, and, uh, and some of the work that goes on in the, uh, in the private companies and research institutes. And thirdly, we need increasing partnerships and sources of capital to fuel that growth. Uh, partnerships in terms of angel investment, venture capital, investment banking, and the partnerships with folks like Merck Sharp and Dome uh, in, the, uh, in the pharmaceutical arena who have that experience uh, in developing and commercializing products and helping companies with scarce resources to get there. So those are the challenges. Uh, and I think uh, in addition, what we're beginning to see, there was a report that came out uh, a week or two ago from the uh, Public Policy Institute of California, uh, is that we're facing a widening gap in the, the human resources that we're going to need in the future in California to grow this industry. Uh, so the question is, where do we obtain those resources? Um, and if we can't obtain them through the educational uh, system in California, because we can't graduate enough uh, bachelor's level and PhD level folks, we have to look to elsewhere. And we've always talked about a homegrown workforce here. Uh, I'm not sure that we're going to be able to sustain that growth with a homegrown workforce. Uh, and so I think the challenge there is to, is to continue to build uh, by bringing in resources and, uh, you know, I think, I think we can look to the south to those resources. Well, um, since you said our region extends across Baja California, the homegrown resources, there are lots of them, sitting immediately to your left is one of them. Gerardo is truly a bi-national scientist business entrepreneur who grew up here, was educated here, and is helping to build a global company that leverages resources both in Mexico and on the Torrey Pines Mesa, where he has lots of friends. So Gerardo, from where you sit inside a company, what do you see as the major challenges? Yeah, thanks, thanks again for the invitation, Mary. It's a great honor here to be with a bunch of uh, friends and, and trying to, to promote a little bit of, of what we have of uh, good in both sides. And I agree with the old comments of Joe. Probably I will give a little bit more resolution of what I see from my front, both as a adjunct faculty at CSESE, interacting with very uh, engaged and enthusiastic students. And on the other hand, as a, as a scientist or director in a startup company, facing all the, the challenges and the dilemmas of uh, 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 starting a big company, even if we have a great leader, Craig Venter. Yeah, uh, actually, Gerardo, I'm not sure everyone knows your company. I think Joe and I do. 
but I think that our audience would be quite dazzled by the company you are helping grow in this region and who the founders are and what they're looking at. So would you start there? Yes, uh, Synthetic Genomics is a startup company that was initiated two years ago by Craig Venter. Uh, Craig Venter, for those that know, don't know him, is uh, known for uh, sequencing the human genome on a private enterprise. Cover of Time magazine. <laughs> so yeah, he, he was in the cover of, of International Time magazine. Uh, and and the, the, the cover was related to, to the company because the company, Synthetic Genomics, is trying to, to build cells based on, a, on, a, on the knowledge that has been gained through through the synthetic biology efforts uh, led by Hamilton Smith, a Nobel laureate working at the Venture Institute. So the company is trying to address issues of uh, biofuels, trying to produce uh, new, new uh, uh, generations of combustible that will replace petrochemicals. So we have a, a serious engagement and in, in awareness in the environment preservation, carbon sequestration, and at the same time, trying to make money on a on huge uh, market of the biofuels. So that's, that's, and what I'm doing in the company is trying to isolate novel microbes through the techniques that I have, I have developed in the past and new, new modifications of these techniques that will leverage on the great extent of microbial diversity that we have in our, our ecosystems. So this is what I'm, I'm trying to do now in my free time or my, my spare time. <laughs> I teach a, a, a class in CCS in the biotech department. And this is through my connection. I always try to, to be connected and vinculated with, with my country. And there I teach a class of marine natural products, which in, in essence is making drugs out of, of uh, the natural diversity plants. And we have an emphasis on, on microbes. I was very fortunate that during my time at Diversa, I had to, to lead a project with the University of Hawaii exactly for doing that, to discover uh, drugs uh, from uh, marine organisms, in, in particular for microbes. So I, I go there on the Saturdays and I teach the students some of the, the cutting edge techniques that we use at, at, the, at the biotech company and get engaged and, and, and get them interested in biotechnology. What I see as one of the great challenges is that these two areas the, just across the border, it's very artificial, it's just across the border and, and it's completely different. In San Diego, we have a very high cost for a startup and I've seen that as, as starting synthetic genomics in Torrey Pines. It's very expensive to have a, a company start up even just buying supplies, not to mention the overhead cost if you want to hire someone on fringe benefits, etc. And on the other side of the border, we have a, a very good, uh, uh, talented people, very engaged, very creative. Scientists in Mexico face the, the, the challenge that everything is much more expensive than what you've got here, and the funds are much lower. So you have to be very innovative and creative. And so the students there have a lots of ideas and, and so on, but the, the problem is that there is a big disconnect with the, the business side, with the what are these ideas going on. So what it really needs is a, a new paradigm in the education and a shift in this and, and complement what the San Diego region has, which is the high tech in, in Mexico, we can establish a, a companies or small operations based on the low cost of, of overhead, the low supplies, and the incredible amount that is of supply of talented uh, resources. Well, let me press you and then jump back to Joe. Uh, this seems extremely logical, that a startup in San Diego would find a good Mexican partner through a young scientist or an entrepreneur like you. Why doesn't it happen more? What are the barriers? What, what, what would have to happen for more of more relationships to grow. I think the, from, from the Mexican side, it needs to be a little bit of, of shift in the paradigm, the way we think and the way we conceive a project. Uh, successful companies, Microsoft, Apple, um, Invitrogen, a bi large $3.5 billion biotech company in, in San Diego, started in a garage, started with a great idea and started identifying a, a niche, a market niche that will be addressed in Mexico, I guess it, it takes some time for us to, to understand that we get training in, in some technical aspects, but we don't know how is this going to solve a problem. We're inventing hammers, but we don't know where are the nails. Where the nail is. So uh -huh. I think it needs to be a little bit of, of a part-time shift and start getting more in-depth uh, knowledge on, on the business side and get more business savvy to really 
connect these two parts. When you connect a, a great uh, business leadership with a, with a, a good technology platform, you win. And, and I think that's what uh, it needs to be changed, and, and probably at different levels from the educational system where people teaching biotechnology preferably will have any uh, experience in, in companies, in certain companies, and, and also students that engage in, in, a, in a graduate studies will expect not to, to become a, a copy of, of their professor or their advisor, but get more entrepreneurship and start companies and start thinking of how solve and self-employ and, and make a business opportunities, identify those business opportunities. So Joe Gerardo talked about what he felt were some of the barriers on the Mexican side. What do you think are the barriers on our side of the border to more partnerships? That's a good question. I, I think it goes back to the fact that uh, for over a hundred years, San Diego has been very self-sufficient. We've tended to try to do everything that we need to grow whatever it is we're trying to grow, whether it be a defense economy or a tourism economy, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. with the resources that we have. And if we don't have those resources, uh, we create them somehow. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And it goes back to this concept that I mentioned about a homegrown workforce. Um, everything that we do uh, and that we have done in the past, I think, we've done primarily on our own here. And we haven't had the, the, uh, the vision to look outside of San Diego, either at um, so much at, at the competition or the opportunity uh, to, to partner. So I think, I think that's been part of the issue. I think the other part of the issue has just simply been that there hasn't been a knowledge or an appreciation for the kinds of resources that might exist across the border. But I think we're beginning to see that change a little bit. And I think what we need, I think the challenge is that those who have gone across the border and had success uh, need to have the opportunity, to be given the opportunity to uh, get in front of folks who might benefit by going across the border. And you know, one of the, the big examples is a company up in North County, DJ Orthopedic, sure. uh, which has just had tremendous success in Mexico. Uh, but I don't think that that's a well-known story, right. and I think there are probably other stories like that that could be communicated. But I think what you're saying is very interesting, Joe, about San Diego. Before we even talk about Mexico, you're saying, we have to acknowledge that San Diego has lived in a kind of splendid isolation for a long time. Absolutely. I mean, I, before I came down for this meeting, just coincidentally, I was up in Orange County at a meeting with a, with a gentleman who runs an organization in Orange County. Now, in this regional view that we have, we believe Mexico, San Diego County, Orange County should all work together. But he said to me, you know, we understand that you have a task force, an Orange County task force. And I said, we do. And uh, he said, we don't like that. And I said, <laughs> well, why not? He said, that word task force, it sounds very military. <laughs> and I said, well, I didn't realize that. I guess I come from a military town and task force doesn't sound military to us. And he said, well, it sounds military to us and it's very threatening, so maybe you should change the name. Oh boy. So that's, that's uh, I think, an example of how you know, we, we tend to think uh, in, a, in a very insular way here. Yes, yes. And it's good to get out and, and talk to other people once in a while. Yes. <laughs> So perhaps, and maybe this we say to Ruben and to James Clark at the Chamber and the Mexico Business Center, we need to do more programs that showcase successful partnerships in these new global uh, domains uh, because people will get information, but they'll also get to know people, which would be very nice, who would be potential partners. All right, Dr. Ortega, the advisor to the Minister of the Economy. <laughs> How are you responding? You heard Deborah's presentation. You got a chance to quickly look at some of the data. Uh, you've heard Joe and Gerardo talk about our region and some of the barriers. And as you think about national policy and where Mexico is heading, uh, any ideas about what this could mean or should mean? Thank you very much, Mary. Uh, uh, thank you for putting me to work. Yes. For your for lunch. <laughs> this this uh, <laughs> confirms once again that there's not such a thing like a free lunch. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> well, um, I think um, in Mexico, as in the U.S., but maybe more in Mexico, we have different challenges. One is that um, if we want to keep growing in the 
international arena in the trade, we have to move to added value and high-tech processes. There's no way we can compete with the Chinese shoes and the Chinese leather jackets. Mexico has no future in that regard. So I think we have to move on high-tech uh, products and processes. I think this is a great opportunity and it's a very good news to reading this paper that uh, we have such a big talent in Mexico, we have such a big opportunities. And um, maybe, Joe, the, the, to your friend, you can tell him that, okay, the, the right word is not a, is not a uh, task force, but a partnership. Yeah. I think we have been working on partnerships, as uh, Dara mentioned, we were fully involved in the creation of the pa Partnership for Prosperity. By the way, the Partnership for Prosperity now in the relationship between Mexico and the U.S. is in the framework of the SPP, Security and Prosperity Partnership of North America. But we have, as I mentioned this morning, the, the, the Mexican, the Mexico-U.S. chapter. And this is part of this, uh, of, this same, of this same group. So we definitely want to move and have to move and are forced to move into this direction. Uh, but uh, as you know, we have uh, two or three, maybe four Mexicos. Uh, one is the Mexico on the north that uh, is uh, capable to work on these uh, added value products and process. We have other part of Mexico, unfortunately, that we have to start with industry, we have to, to start with the culture of business and industry. So we have different, uh, but this part we should be. The, the great challenge that I see we have is uh, to find a way to link the science and technology investigation and development with the companies in Mexico. That haven't, uh, hasn't passed in the, in the past. And in saying this, uh, to link the universities, investigation areas, with the enterprises and work to innovate, this is a big challenge. Uh, the good news is that uh, for us, at least for our Department of Economy, is that uh, the chairman of the board of uh, CONACIT, the Mexican Agency for Science and Technology, um, is our, the Secretary of Economy. So uh, we're going to really work during these next years to do uh, this to happen, to connect uh, science and technology with the, the private sector. In this regard, we're modifying uh, the regulation in this precise moment. And uh, we uh, agree with the Science and Technology Industry and Congress that the new regulation will contemplate two areas. One, the investigation, the, the relationship with the, uh, the science uh, community is going to be done on this regulation by CONACYT. But in the economy and secretary, we're going to be the link with the private sector and the business community. So we're going to work together and really advance on this, uh, on this uh, subject. I think this, as I said, is a great idea. Uh, one area of opportunity, we're also uh, changing the regulation for medicine certification, medicines and medical uh, products in Mexico. We have a regulation in the past saying that uh, in order to, to be approved, you, gotta have, you, you were forced to have a plant in Mexico, requisito a plant. You need to have an installation of formal plant, productive plant, and then you, were, uh, uh, you have the, capa the capacity to get approved your medicines. This is changing right now, and this will open a tremendous opportunity for private certification laboratories. So uh, uh, I think uh, it's important that the, the, the business community in the United States knows this because there are going to be uh, uh, potential uh, alliances, business alliances uh, in this sector because we have to renew the, the certification of medicines in Mexico in the next couple of years. More than 28,000 medicines have to be approved. And we want to do this with the, the, the industry in Mexico and the opportunities for the industry, the companies that already have these uh, uh, plants, these product plants, they, they automatically are going to be keep uh, approving and certifying the, the, the medicines, but we have this opportunity for the other companies that don't have these laboratories. 
So this is an area of opportunity I think that we have to, to take advantage of. It's a very exciting perspective on the, on the big picture. Before we open it up to any audience questions, I'm going to ask each of you, so Deborah, you get to talk too. <laughs> if you were to think about uh, at least two, but not more than four things that really must happen in the next three to five years, I'm trying to be very actionable ideas. What, from where you sit in Merck and knowing these regions and knowing what's happening at the national level, what would you recommend? If you were queen for a day, what would you recommend? <laughs> uh, to earn one million, no. <laughs> uh, in terms of creating innovation in Mexico. Right. Um, first of all, I would, uh, without a doubt, create very efficient technological transfer and commercialization programs for the university, university or for the region by itself, first of all, with very high quality level people preparing these terms. I think that's absolutely necessary. Second, I would work in terms of capital, uh, venture capital and angel capital with the private sector. I, I, that's something that we absolutely need. And third, I would continue promoting the kind of initiatives we have here in which knowledge of binational regions, it's mm -hmm. so important for understanding and partnership, the, those three things. So Joe, you, you can be US centric if you want, because I know you're interested in partnerships, but what do you feel are the two or three most important things we need to do to keep this prospering and growing sector moving? Well, I think it, for me it gets back to, to regionalism and the need to grow as a region uh, together combining the strengths that we have. Um, I th but I think in order to be able to do that, we have to make sure that we capitalize uh, on the opportunities in each region to, to grow and, and, and prosper. So one of the things I think needs to happen um, is for there to be more exposure from the Mexican side uh, to the kinds of innovative companies and the work that goes on in those companies here in this region. So that hopefully, as we have more success here, the people who participate in that success might have the opportunity to go back across the border mm -hmm. and translate that success into new companies, just as we've had happen here beginning almost 30 years ago with, right. with, with HyberTech. Um, I think the next thing to, to sort of reiterate what, what Deborah is saying is risk capital uh, and the, the, the concept of acceptance of risk and of the fact that risk capital is exactly that. Um, I, I think we need to see more of, of that understanding uh, being translated across the border in, into Mexico. Mm -hmm. And I think the third thing is uh, getting back to my regional uh, comment. This, this competitiveness that, that we're dealing with globally uh, should show us that, that we together need to promote all of the strengths that we have. The great science that goes on in Mexico, uh, the company formation here, again up in Orange County, which is, which is a medical device hotbed. Uh, we need to bring that all together and, and promote it globally so that people see this, this entire region as, as what it, it has the, the, the potential to be. Gerardo, as the true binational person on the panel, what do you see as the highest priorities? Well, I, I just, when you asked the question, I just kept uh, asking myself, what could I do like today? What, what is an, an immediate action item? If I had the chance, I would go and talk to Greg Lucier, uh, CEO of Invitrogen. And uh, is a, a $3.5 billion company that has operations in, in China and Latin America, I think, in, in Argentina, but somehow they closed those. And I will tell them that in Ensenada, one and a half hour going south, there is a gorgeous drive along the, the coast, drive. and then uh, there is a place there where, where it's a, a very high density of uh, talented students, even a biotech uh, uh, program, graduate program, and several uh, academic institutions. And I will convince him that uh, it will be a very good idea 
to set up operations that will have uh, somehow uh, some uh, IP because in, in China they don't have anything of the IP because obviously they're the lack of it. Mexico has a, a very good uh, IP compared at, at the international levels. And I will convince him to set up operations, for example, making competent cells or maybe something that is very labor intensive that could make the, a break for them to have a, a, a cheaper cost of goods and, and have establish and anchor a big operation that will start uh, clustering, will first employ people there and then uh, will start uh, catalyzing. All the people will start to go there and, and seek for the opportunities. After I talk to Greg, I will talk to Dr. Alberto Ortega and convince <laughs> him that they should make it easy for guys like, like uh, uh, Greg Lucier and all other uh, transnational companies that want to set up operation. They have to make it very easy and very simplify and fast track because uh, uh, understandably, these companies have fears of going in Mexico because of the convoluted, and I will not go there. And the third thing, probably I could not do that today, but what I will do is to, to talk to the, the Ministry of Education in Mexico and, and convince them that there is a need to change the paradigm in education. Uh, there are some initiatives of uh, UCSD and others to try to train postdocs and, and get this knowledge that it's necessary to connect the fantastic idea with the market, and this is a big gap, and, and as long as this is not connected, then it's very difficult to have success. So I, I will uh, advocate the, the, the sponsorship of uh, initially training few individuals and, and embedding them in companies, get them trained, and bring that knowledge back to, to Mexico and set up companies there with that paradigm and start the, this flux, and I, I think those are pretty, pretty reasonable things to, to do. These are fantastic ideas. Are you inspired, Dr. Ortega? It's, it's my turn. <laughs> it's your turn. He wants the last word, and then we'll open yes. it to any Q so and A. I, uh, we're right. in the in the in the time of dream. Yes. So we're dreaming right now. What we we can do. Well, the things uh, dreams come true sometimes. Eh? Uh, what I will do, I will promote the California's Science and Technology Initiative and I will hire Deborah and Gerardo here to run it, to put all these projects together. And Joe and I want to be your, and Joe and I want to be your lead consultants. <laughs> all right, we have about uh, five to eight minutes if there are questions. Simon, please, and introduce yourself, please, and a mic is coming. I'm Simon Goldbart. I work with Mary in San Diego Dialogue. I'm also binational. I know everybody here. I'm, a, I'm an entrepreneur too. I formed companies in San Diego, sold them. And I've been helping Mary in this program to go through Mexico and evaluate what um, Deborah calls ama an amazing technology. However, there is a big stumbling block. Nobody's talked about it. And as I'll ask Dr. Ortega to please be the messenger okay. to the government on this. And this, there is no, and there's nothing in Mexico compared to the Bayh-Dole Act that was passed here in the 1980s. Mexican scientists can't take their inventions and form companies on their own. They're just not permitted by the government. That's something that Joe can talk about is, Bayh-Dole completely transformed at least the biotechnology industry here. It's what made it possible. If Mexican scientists can't take their inventions and form their own companies, they're not allowed by law. We can't transfer technology easily. If that is not changed, nothing is going to happen. It's just an enormous stumbling block. So I would ask Dr. Ortega to please go back to the authorities in Mexico and talk about this because it, it's, a, it's the biggest gorilla in the room. Yeah. We have to go to the legislators. Yes. And I will ask you to, to write me a note with the, all the details so we can because we need be champions help. all of us to do that and it'll be very helpful Thank perhaps you very much. not everyone in the room knows about by dole but back in the <laughs> 1980s uh birch by and bob dole and actually the former president of the university of california dick atkinson who at the time was head of nsf drafted legislation that uh, enabled the recipients of federal research funds, which means universities or the Salk Institute or you know any institution that was the home for federally funded research, to uh, 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 
basically be the lead negotiator for the intellectual property. They were empowered to do that. And so you've gotten the explosion of patenting and innovative companies in a number of regions around the United States because they've been empowered to build uh, the kinds of teams uh, that can do that. And it's an important observation. I, the lights are bright, so I don't know if there are any other questions or comments from our audience. If not, I want to thank you all for being with us uh, this year. Hopefully a year from now, we'll have a forum in which we will describe some of the new company partnerships that have emerged from the wonderful ideas and intentions of our various panelists. Thank you again, and thank you, Deborah, for your presentation.